It's awkward, isn't it? <laughs> Real weird. We don't like silence. Silence is strange, is awkward, and we live in a culture that does its best to drown out silence, which is kind of a weird concept when you think about it. It's a strange feeling. We don't know what to do with it. Like if you're home by yourself, many of you will put on the TV. Why? So there's some noise going. There's something. It's not silent house, right? If, you, uh, if you're working on something, you'll maybe put in your headphones and listen to some music, something to distract you while you're going. Uh, we Ever ride in a car by yourself without anything on? Silent. We don't like silence. We like noise. We like to hear noise. We live in a noisy culture. We even have people who their professional job is to be a what? Talking head. They don't really say anything. They just talk. That's how Oprah made her money. She talked. And she keeps talking. Heaven help us. One of the worst forms of silence is not your spouse not talking to you. It's not anybody commenting on one of your social media posts. One of the worst forms of silence is the silence of God. It's quiet. And still, you, you just, it feels oppressive sometimes. And so what I want us to talk about today is how do we respond to the silence of God? Because the silence of God is still God communicating to us. And so how do we respond in that moment? What's the appropriate way to listen? So we're going to be in a bunch of different Job passages. We're continuing in our study of Job. And Job deals with, for about 30 some odd chapters, the silence of God. And so I want us to look at Job and look at how he responds and kind of compare it to the way we want to respond. So I want us to look at silence, I want us to look at noise, and then I want us to look at kind of the way we handle the response. The first thing about silence is that we view silence as the actual problem. We view silence as the actual problem. Look in Job chapter 30, verse 16. Job chapter 30, verse 16. This is kind of towards the end of the book, and Job is wrapping up what he is saying, some of his complaints, and he says, and now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold of me. The night racks my bones, and the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. With great force, my garment is disfigured. It binds me about like the collar of my tunic. God has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. Now, we know that Job has a relationship with God. He talks to God. He's engaged with God. He's talked to God uh, before, because we know it from chapter 1, where he's offering sacrifices on behalf of his children, God, Job has a relationship with God. So he's called out to God before, and God has answers. He's calling out to God now, and God is not answering. And the difference between the two silences of God are the circumstances that surround the silence. Because when everything's going great and everything's good, business is booming, marriage is great, family is great, you've got friends and things to do with your friends, the silence of God is a curiosity. You have your quiet time, you spend some time in the Word, maybe you go to church a couple weeks and you're like, you know, I really feel like God's speaking to me right now. And you're like, that's kind of weird. And you just kind of go on. You're like, that's something to think about, something to pray about, something to invest in. But when you're in the midst of calamity... When tragedy is striking, when everything's difficult around you, then the silence of God is deafening. It's crushing. It becomes this sort of urgent thing to figure out, why isn't God talking to me? What did I do wrong? Why, why aren't you listening to me, God? Why aren't you there? What's wrong? The silence of God becomes deafening. Look at what Job says in verse 20. I cry to you for help, and you do not answer me. I stand, and you only look at me. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me, you lift me up on the wind, and you make me ride on it, and you toss me about in the roar of the storm, for I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all the living. Job comes to this amazing conclusion. God is silent, and he's done all this stuff to me, therefore he must be trying to kill me. That's what he thinks. He thinks that God is trying to kill him. And that's what it feels like to us too. It feels like death by silent treatment. We're faced with crushing circumstances, difficult things going around us. We're drowning in our sorrows and we cry out to God 
and God just looks at us. We're drowning in misery, and God's like this lifeguard that just seems to be watching us drown and like, yeah, figure it out. He doesn't do anything. Job even comments on this. He says, I feel like I'm in a whirlwind. You've brought me up with all this success and amazing gifts and blessings and family only to bring me up really high so you can throw me back down and dash me on the ground. You did all this on purpose, God. You've become cruel to me. And when we come back down to the ground, we look back up at God and we think, what the heck, God? I thought you were supposed to be there for me. We might even say language stronger than that to God because we're hurting. There's nothing but silence. And we think that God has it out for us because silence isn't the problem. The silence isn't the problem. It's the circumstances around the silence. And then it's the silence that exacerbates the problem. It makes things worse. When all is good, all is well, the silence of God is a curiosity, like I said. But when things are hard, the silence of God becomes something else. Why is that? It's because we equate the silence of God with God's abandonment. We equate silence with abandonment. We expect God to be there in the midst of difficulty. If you're a, an airline pilot and you're flying and you're, you're going to land your plane and everything's normal and you radio into the tower and you say, hey, we're, we're coming in, we need, a, we need a, a place to land. I don't really know how that works because I'm not a pilot. But you say something along those lines. And if air traffic control takes a minute to get back to you, it might not be that big of a deal. So you're like, oh, we got time. But when you radio in and you're like, we're coming in hot, I've got the landing gear kind of down and we're about to crash, we need a landing a spot to land, and there's no response, it becomes a little bit of an emergency. There's some concern. I had this happen with my wife and I uh, this week, Tuesdays, she's in class all day, and so it's very hard for her to respond to a phone call. I still call her though, uh, because I don't like silence in the car, so when I'm driving somewhere, I pick up the phone and I leave singing voicemails to my wife that you will never hear. <laughs> and so we're I'm just going to play them at my funeral just over and over again. And so when I call her and, and leave those messages, I don't really care that she doesn't get back to me. But later on Tuesday afternoon, we were trying to figure out what we are going to do for dinner, which is amazing that dinner comes around every single day, and I still don't know what we're doing for dinner on a daily basis. And, and I call, and I don't get back to her. And then she calls me, and I call her back, and it goes straight to voicemail. And I'm like, what's going on? And I become frustrated because I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know when I'm supposed to leave to go meet her and my daughter and all this stuff going on because it was urgent. She didn't do anything wrong. She's not at my back end call. But, but it's, it's frustrating because we equate somebody being there with somebody speaking, somebody responding when we need them. You know, you're not the first person to wrestle with the silence of God. I'm sure you know that. But I think you'd be surprised that one of the people who wrestled with the silence of God is Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. In Jesus' last hours on earth, he turns to God. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane with some of his disciples, and he prays with them. He says, you guys wait here. I'm going to go pray. They fall asleep, because who hasn't done that during prayer? And they're, they're, he's in the garden. He's praying, and he says, Lord, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will. And we don't have recordings of, of what God said. We don't know if God said anything in that moment. But it doesn't look like he did, because if he had said something audibly, we would have had it written down, because Jesus' words were written down. And then we fast forward to the cross, and God still doesn't speak. You don't hear an audible voice of God. And the cross is the climax of Jesus' mission. It's what he's here for. And there's no voice from God. Now, you might say to yourself, well, Travis, that's kind of normal. Like, God doesn't always speak. Yeah, you're right, except God the Father has spoken at every high point in Jesus' ministry up to that point. When Jesus was born, how was it announced to a bunch of shepherds? Full-on, heavenly host, singing and proclaiming. The baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. Dove descends from heaven. Clouds open. Voice speaks. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus showing his glory to the disciples. The voice speaks again, and it's the same message. During a miracle, the voice of God speaks. Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus needs him most, silence. He's doing exactly what God wants him to do. He's perfect, and there's silence. And so he's on the cross, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus, even though he's the Son of God, feels abandoned 
He's not abandoned, but he feels abandoned in the midst of the silence of God. It is our circumstances that dictate whether the silence of God is a curiosity or is a calamity. Silence is not the problem. It never is. It just feels like abandonment when our circumstances say we need help. We need help. And the silence of God becomes something that it was never meant to be. We start thinking that God's abandoned us. We start thinking we did something wrong, that he's disgusted with us, that he hates us, or worse, that he's not even there, that he doesn't even exist. The absence of God is not the absence of his, or sorry, the silence of God is not the absence of his presence. And the presence of difficulty and calamity is not the absence of grace. We think the wrong thing about the silence of God. We think it means abandonment. It is not. It does not. So because we misunderstand the silence of God, we misunderstand how to respond to it. We think that noise is how we fix the problem. We think noise is how you fix the problem. So far, we really haven't talked much about Job's three friends, uh, Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. If you're, looking, if you're pregnant right now and looking for some names for a boy... May I submit to you Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. In fact, if you're having a boy, name him Bildad. You can shorten it to Bill, and then when he becomes a father himself, he's Bildad, right? It's great. It, it, it takes care of itself, yeah. A little dad joke for you there. This is, gets me through the day. All right. So we haven't talked too much about his friends, but his friends show up, and they're great to begin with. They sit with him in silence for seven days and mourn with him, and then when Job opens his mouth, they start talking, which is good. If you're ever in a grief situation and you don't know what to do, be quiet until the person who's grieving speaks. Then respond. That's a great thing to do. The friends are great so far. But then Job says some things that makes them a little uncomfortable spiritually, they're like, uh, I think you're blaspheming right now. We're going to step in and correct your theology. When someone's grieving, that's not the time to correct their doctrine and theology. Later is a good time. Now is not. So rather than look at all of their speeches, let's look at Zophar in chapter 11. Uh, chapter 11. Uh, because at this point, you know, we're, we've heard a few of their speeches, and Zophar so good. Um, we're, we're good to hear. You're welcome for that one, too. So his buddy Zophar is talking, and Zophar kind of sums up what, what they say. Uh, so let's look. The first thing he tells Job, and, and, and what we kind of gather from sort of these things, is that there are more words from us. If we say more words, then God will give us more words. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. Then Zophar the Namathite answered and said, Should a multitude of words go unanswered, and a man full of talk be judged right? Should your babble silence men? And when you mock, shall no one shame you? For you say, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in God's eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for he is manifold in understanding. Now, don't say this ever in grief counseling. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Wow. Harsh words. Zophar accuses Job of speaking a bunch of stuff and not really knowing what he's talking about. Babel. Talk. The irony is that in Job chapter 42, verse 7, when God finally shows up and starts speaking, you know what he says? He says, Job has spoken about me truthfully, you three have not. So it's actually Zophar and the guys that are not speaking truthfully. They're the ones babbling, they're the ones talking. We like to talk. It's an occupational hazard for me, but all of us really like to talk. We like to talk about ourselves, we like to talk about what we're doing. We like to talk. We like to talk about uh, what other people are doing, right? We think that prayer is talking. We don't really pay attention to Matthew 6, 7, where Jesus says, don't heap up in empty phrases like the Gentiles do when you pray. We're like, Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about when it comes to prayer. We think that pray without ceasing, that great verse that we quote, is actually talk without ceasing. That's, that's our, our motto there. And what's weird is this isn't actually a Christian practice. It's not a Christian practice to just think you have a great prayer life because you talk, 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 talk to God all the time. In fact, you see it in 1 Kings chapter 18. So it's one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. You see uh, there, there are these prophets of Baal. There's about 400 of them. And Elijah is the only prophet of God on the scene. And he challenges 
the, the worshipers of Baal, the prophets of Baal, uh, to a little match. They're going to set up two altars. They're going to put a dead animal on top of it, and they're going to cry out to Baal, and they're going to cry out to Yahweh. And whichever one responds with fire from heaven to consume the, the offering, that's the real God. So the prophets of Baal get to work. They're screaming and crying and cutting themselves and calling out for Baal to do stuff. And what's awesome about it is uh, Elijah is like the greatest trash talker in the history of, of the world. He's like, you guys should yell louder. Maybe he's in the bathroom relieving himself. Like, it's great. And so finally they give up exhausted at the end of the day. It's, it's fantastic. And then Job says it's his turn. And he adds some water to the fire. And then in chapter 18 of verse 36, this is what he says. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back. Then fire of the Lord consumed the offering. Two sentences. Boom. It is an incredibly pagan practice for us to talk, 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 and try thinking that that is coaxing God out of hiding. Like he's a puppy that's underneath like a piece of furniture and trying to get him to come out. And you think that talking a lot will get him to do that. That's a pagan practice. God is not coaxed or coerced out of hiding. He is. And he is there. And you don't have to say a whole lot. But it's not just enough that we like to talk. We also like to have people talk for us and with us. When you first run into a problem, who's the first person you talk to? Probably a spouse, probably a significant other, maybe a roommate, maybe a friend. Probably not God. God very rarely is the first person we go to. And especially if he's been silent lately, we're like, I'm not going to go to God. He's just going to be quiet. We also like to get expert opinions, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we just inundate ourselves with expert opinions, right? Again, we go back to the talking heads. We, we flood ourselves with news media. We try and figure things out, and so we listen to experts. Or when we don't want to deal with the problem anymore, you know what we do? We just turn on Netflix. We turn on sports. We turn on the TV, and we forget for a little while that we have a problem. We escape. We drown out the problem with, with noise. We think that more words, more noise is how we get something from God. That's not right. Zophar goes on to talk, and he says that more knowledge equals more words from God. More knowledge gets you more words from God. Look at verse 7 in chapter 11 of Job. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It's higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he passes through and imprisons and summons the court, who can turn him back? For he knows worthless men, when he sees iniquity, will he not consider it? But a stupid man will get understanding when a wild donkey's colt is born to a man. Zophar keeps saying that Job doesn't understand how God works, which the subtle implication is that Zophar knows how God works. Zophar's got it all figured out. He's taking Job to school. He's putting Job in his place. And this is a really kind of Western culture thing that we do now, is that we think that the way we get closer to God is to get more knowledge about him. So we treat God like the subject to be studied, which God, there is theology, you can study God, but it is not the answer to dealing with the silence of God. So we go to Bible studies, we get books, we listen to podcasts, we do everything we can to learn about God, but you're not actually getting to know God. You're getting to know about Him him. And the reason I think why we do this is because we think if we can just figure out who God is, he won't surprise me anymore. He'll stop scaring me. What do they say about Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia? He's good, but he's not safe. Aslan's kind of the Christ figure in those books. Going to scripture and getting to know God through scripture is a good thing. This is the revelation of God. He has spoken through his word to you. That's a good thing. But if you think by learning Greek, Hebrew, uh, different cases and, and different doctrines and all this stuff, history, if your journey is essentially the CIA fact book of God, if that's what you think scripture is, you will be sorely disappointed. 
And here's why. God is in the scriptures. God is talked about in the scriptures. But the scriptures are not God. And in our tradition, in the Baptist world, in an evangelical culture, we've pretty much removed the Holy Spirit as the third member of the Trinity and just put this in its place. Scripture is good. It's not deity. We need to be careful. We need to be careful what we do with that. And that moves us on to the third thing that he says we need to do to make some noise. More religion means we get more words from God. Verse 13 If you prepare your heart, you'll stretch out your hands towards him. And if iniquity is in your hand, put it far away and let not injustice dwell in your tents. Surely then you'll lift up your face without blemish and you'll be secure and you won't fear. You'll forget about misery and you'll remember it as waters that have passed away. And your life will be brighter than the noonday. Its darkness will be like the morning and you will feel secure because there is hope. And you'll look around and take your rest in security. You'll lie down and none will make you afraid. Many will court your favor. And stop there. Zovar closes his little speech by saying that if you would just start acting religious, you'd start feeling better. You need to repent. You need to turn back to God because if you would just repent, he would forgive you. And Job's like, I don't have anything to repent from. And Zophar's pretty much saying, just make something up, dude. Like, just say you're sorry for something. You've done something. Like, just say you're sorry for anything, and God will forgive you. And then notice all the things that he says will happen. You'll feel right because you'll feel religious. Look at the phrases he uses. You'll be secure and not fear. You'll forget your misery. You'll feel secure. You'll sleep well, and people will court your favor, meaning people will want to know about you and be influential. We think being religious is having a relationship with God. And so oftentimes, we're willing to trade religion or sorry, a real relationship with God for something that looks good and feels good. We like noise. We like noise. We like talk. And we don't really talk about this a lot, but what happened to Jesus while he was in the tomb? What are people doing those three days? It's actually quite a lot of activity. We don't spend a lot of time on it. But there's a lot of activity taking place. Joseph of Arimathea is going to get the body. Mary Magdalene goes and grieves at the tomb. The women are preparing spices. Pharisees are freaked out that somebody's going to steal the body. So they post guards at the tomb. Pilate has got people in charge and, and running around doing all sorts of stuff. And they all handle the death of the Son of God the exact same way. The silence of Jesus is handled all the same way, whether they're incredibly religious and love Jesus or not. They get busy. They start working. They make noise. And what is Jesus doing? He's waiting. He's waiting. Jesus handles the silence of God the way we should handle the silence of God. He waits. He waits. Let's talk about how to wait. We meet God's silence with waiting. We meet God's silence with waiting. This is what Job is doing. Job is waiting on God. He's sitting in the ashes, waiting on Job, waiting on God to show up. Uh, he's, he's listening to his friends talk, he's listening to his wife talk, but he is waiting on God to show up. And we know this because at the very end of the book, when God finally shows up, Job pretty much says, I'm satisfied. I'm good. This is what I was waiting for. I'm good. I didn't know what I was talking about. And so if you want to handle the silence of God well, you need to wait. And it's not waiting on a bus, like where you just sit and kind of passing the time. It's an active spiritual discipline to wait. So you're doing some things and the The really old theologian John Owen has a lot of great ideas on how to wait. So we're going to talk about three of them. The first thing we need to invest in is quietness. Quietness. In Job chapter 31, verse 40, it says, The words of God or of Job are ended. The words of Job are ended, which means Job shuts up. There's a little segment where a guy named Elihu speaks, and then God starts talking. God starts talking when everybody else is quiet. So we have a lot of noise around us. A lot of talking heads, a lot of TV, a lot of, a lot of music. We need to quiet all that stuff down. But the big thing you need to quiet is your soul. You need to quiet your soul. Because it hemorrhages what-ifs and hypotheticals like it's going out of style. It's just what-if, what-if, what-if. And we get distracted, we get consumed, we get anxious, we get worried. And you have to speak to your soul. This isn't a Disney movie, okay? You can't follow your heart and get to the right answer. Your heart is deceitful and will lie to you, okay? You need to quiet your soul. So you tell your soul, you tell your heart what it's supposed to believe. So in the silence of God, when when your heart is saying, he must have abandoned me, he must have forgotten me, you're like, no! 
The gospel says that Jesus will never leave me or forsake me. Heart, get in your right place. And it'll quiet down. Now, if you're not a believer, if you don't have a relationship with God, the gospel will never quiet your soul. It'll just stir it up because it's missing something. It's like, that's what I want. That's what I need. Give that to me. And my deepest concern is that you're going to walk out of here and you're going to have your heart stirred up by the gospel and you're not going to respond. You're going to quiet your soul in the wrong way. You're going to quench the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that you can be forgiven. You can believe that today. You can talk to somebody about that today. Quiet all the noise and the doubt and the fear that comes with that and listen to the voice of God. Listen to the gospel. So we quiet our souls. We also need to be diligent. We need to be diligent. One thing you can say about Job is he's pretty persistent. He sticks to his integrity. And if we're going to wait on God, we've got to be diligent. We've got to be persistent as well. We need to diligently pursue the Lord even when it doesn't seem like he's there. Now, I did talk about going to Scripture can be dangerous. Yeah, if you're looking for like facts about God, it's dangerous. But the truth of the matter is, if you're going to Scripture to learn, to, to meet with God, to hear from Him, just to, to spend time in His presence, that's a good thing. God has revealed Himself in three ways, three primary ways. He's spoken through nature, His creation. So maybe get out of the city. This place is noisy. Get out. Even, I've got real smooth hands. I don't like the outdoors. But even I do well getting outside. Go into creation. Go into his scripture where he's revealed who he is. And don't just learn about him. Talk with him. Interact with him. Spend time chewing on one verse. Just one. Dig deep into scripture. And then Jesus, he's spoken through Jesus Christ. God has spoken through Jesus Christ, through his son. If you want to know what God, the fa- who the father is, look at the son. He'll tell you. So when you feel like God is silent, be diligent. Be diligent in prayer. Be diligent in meditation. Be diligent in reading and hearing the word. Be diligent in coming together with community. Not so that you can have noise drowned out, but so they can speak truth into your life. John Owen says this about those things. They are all appointed to this purpose. They are all means of communicating love and grace to the soul. Did you hear that? They're all means of communicating. God communicates to us. And the funny thing is, he's given us his word, which means he's not silent. He's spoken through it. Spoken through it. All of this, however, is worthless if there's no expectation. If there's no expectation. Job 19, 25, he says, My Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer lives. Job is expectant that God is going to do something. God's going to show up and save the day. God's going to do something. If you are quiet in your soul and diligent in your prayers, but you are not expecting God to do anything, what's the point? If I show up tomorrow at Chick-fil-A, because I will, if I show up tomorrow at Chick-fil-A and I'm hoping to meet you there, and we didn't schedule an appointment, and I just wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, Is it your fault you didn't show up? No. I am stupid for expecting you, but God has said he will not leave us. So we can wait. We can expect him to be there. We wait on God. There are many people in our church who have had to wait on God in the midst of difficult circumstances. In our sanctuary right now, there's a lady named Verdell Davis. Verdell is a great woman of faith. Uh, Her husband was on the board at Focus on the Family uh, a couple decades ago. And the board was flying back from uh, one of their meetings, and they lost contact with the plane, and the plane crashed. And everybody was lost. And Verdell, her worst nightmares realized, realized that she had to wait on God. She had to expect him to do something. In our midst right now, we have a great saint who's been working in our church for a long time, John Parker. Many of you know him. Many of you have met with him and talked with him. He helps us with our South Texas trips. John's family has had a whole host for about 12 years now of just health difficulties, health challenges, 
people passing away, loved ones passing away because of health difficulties. And I talked to John this week about it to, to make sure it was okay to share a little bit of his story. And he said, you know, the thing that I just kind of realized is that God knows my life and what's good for me better than I do. And so I trust him. That's quieting your soul. That's telling your soul what it's supposed to believe. Not letting your soul tell you what feels right. Your soul will get it wrong sometimes. So what I want us to do now is I want us to to be silent again. And this time it won't be as awkward because we're gonna, we, we know how to handle the silence now. First, I want you to quiet your heart, quiet your soul. It's busy. You're going to be thinking about football or food. You're going to think about all sorts of stuff. Quiet it down. Tell it to rest in the Lord. Tell your soul that this is a time for us to hear from God. Tell your soul to listen. Then I want us to be diligent. I want you to think about some prayer, uh, maybe a verse that you know that, that's spoken to you. Maybe you have like a life verse or something that God has always kind of spoken to you through. I want you to go there, either open your Bible and go there or just meditate on it, think about it. Think about something maybe that was said here. Maybe there's a verse that we talked about here that, that really caught your attention. And quiet your soul, be diligent. And then I want you to expect, I want you to expect God to speak. And I'm not a prophet. I'm not going to guarantee that God will speak because that's, that's not my job and, and I don't have that authority. But here's what I will say. Come with expectation and know that eventually he will speak. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, God will speak. And if you don't, God will speak too and he will tell you one thing. Come to the cross. Come to the cross. So whatever God may say in this time, maybe it'll push you to baptism or push you to join the church. Or maybe just push you to forgive someone or to embrace someone, to love someone. Maybe to take a step volunteering and serving here at the church. I'm not going to say what God will say. But I think with expectation, we're waiting diligently on the Lord. And if we continue to wait, he will not disappoint us. He won't let us down. He hasn't abandoned us. He's there. And he's ready to speak. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as the band comes on stage and as we process what it is that you've said, Lord God, we, we hope and expect you to speak. We are like Martha. We are busy about many things. But Lord, we know that the right place, the better choice is to be with you. And so God, I pray that we would quiet our hearts, our souls. We would diligently look to you and with expectation, you would meet with us today. And that we'd hear from you. And we love you, Father. I pray that you would break your silence for our good and for your glory. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.